Hello, in part 3 of my cost of capital series, I show examples of how to calculate the cost of common equity, which is arguably the most important component cost of capital. And that's because it is the basic equity security of the firm. Uh, as you know, common stockholders are the true owners of a company and as a result, have the residual claim on the firm. Their claim comes only after bondholders and preferred stockholders have received their interest payments in the case of bondholders and preferred stock dividends in the case of uh, preferred stockholders. So in that pecking order actually. And so for this reason, common equity is the most um, risky of the three sources of capital because by the time the money trickles down to them, they might wind up with uh, nothing really and therefore the cost of common equity capital is really the highest component cost of capital. As it turns out, estimating the cost of common equity is quite challenging and that's primarily because the dividends paid to common stockholders are typically not fixed and, and in fact in many cases are not even paid at all. I mean if there's no money left, there's no money left. And so we get creative in how, to, in how we estimate the cost of common equity and these are three of the basic methods, the bond yield plus risk premium approach, the capital asset pricing model CAPM, and then the dividend discount uh, model which is the discounted cash flow technique. Alright, so here we go with the first example utilizing the bond yield plus risk premium approach. So this method simply says find me the cost of debt for the firm aka the yield to maturity and to that we're going to add a risk premium which generally tends to range from 3% to 5%. It would be, it'd be on the low end if the firm that um, you are dealing with is uh, a low risk firm with a high credit rating for example and it would be a, at, the high, at the high end if you believe it's a particularly risky firm with a very low credit rating for example and in some cases it can actually go up to 8%. I know what you're asking so how do you get these numbers? Well actually this is just based, uh, this is a, a rule of thumb you know kind of an anecdotal type of uh, uh, gener uh, uh, data and that you plug in to reflect your belief as to the uh, riskiness of the firm that you are, that you are um, evaluating. So in this example we find that the yield to maturity of the firm's bonds is 10.3 percent and you've decided to use the high-end 5 percent risk premium over and above um, uh, to uh, determine to estimate the cost of this firm's uh, common equity and so this comes out to be 15.3 percent and so the risk premium right here is again indicative of how much more risk common stockholders bear over and above their required rate of return on the firm's bonds. The higher the risk premium, the greater the risk that common stockholders um, are shouldering on account of the firm's uh, overall financial and business risk. Alright, so that's a simple linear process but as you can see it's um, primarily a rule of thumb type of approach and lacks rigor. Although that might actually wind up being useful if you're evaluating privately held, for held firms and firms in underdeveloped economies. The second method here is the CAPM approach which utilizes the security market line to estimate the required rate of return on equity which as you know is the same thing as saying cost of equity, common equity capital. So in this example the risk-free interest rate is 5% and that's it right here and to that we're going to add the risk premium of the stock that you are evaluating. So now keep in mind that there are three aspects to this estimation. The first is the market risk premium which is defined as the difference between the re return on the market and the uh, risk-free interest rates right here. In this example it comes out to be 6.5 percent and that's it right here. So the risk premium on the market reflects how much more return investors are requiring to earn over and above the risk-free rate if they were to invest in a well diversified stock portfolio. The second is the risk premium of the stock. The stock's risk premium would take the market risk premium and then adjust it for the systematic risk of the stock measured by beta. 
So in this case, the beta of this stock is 1.7. So as you can see, this stock is a little bit more volatile. It's quite a bit actually more volatile than the market because as you know, the beta of the market as a whole is 1. So a beta of 1.7 means that this stock is 1.7 times as volatile as the market. So adjusting the market risk premium by the beta of this stock gives us the stock's risk premium of 11.05%, telling us that this that investing in this stock that the rational investor would require a return of about 11.05% to compensate for the risk for the incremental risk associated with investing in this stock relative to the risk free asset and so then thirdly overall when you combine the risk free interest rate and the uh, risk premium of the stock then you find an estimate of the required rate of return on this common stock. In this case also the uh, cost of common equity to the firm. Remember the word return is looking at this percentage rate from the stockholder standpoint. So to them it is the required rate of return on this stock but from the issuing firm standpoint what the investor calls a return is what the firm calls costs. Alright so this is going to be the cost of common equity to this firm. The third and final method utilizes the discounted cash flow method, specifically the constant growth method. When we solve for, our, for, for the required rate of return, we find that this definition has two parts to it. The first part right here is the dividend yield components, and the second part, growth, is a reflection of the capital, capital uh, gains uh, yield components of the stock. So with the example we have here, the last dividend paid was $2 and we expect earnings to grow, earnings and dividends to grow at a constant rate of 7% into the foreseeable future. So when we plug and play, dividing by the current price, we find the dividend yield and then we add that to the growth rate to find the required rate of return on this stock, which is the cost of equity to this firm. This cost of equity because it does because it, it does not take into account any flotation costs associated with generating outside capital um, would be viewed as the cost of equity when that common equity is generated internally in the form of retained earnings. So some would refer to this definition as the cost of retained earnings. As you know, retained earnings is internal common equity. It is a, a, it's part of a profit made by the firm which stockholders have decided to reinvest back into the company. So it is internal equity. Now though, that if the firm were to generate common equity by selling new shares of common stock, they're going to have to go through an investment banker for the most part and there's a cost doing that. So in this example, the, the flotation cost here, FLC, comes out to be 12%. That tells us that they're going to have to pay 12% of whatever the price that the stock sells for, in this case $23, to the investment banker. And so that's going to come out to be about $2.76 in flotation costs. Subtract that from the $23 of stock price, the net proceeds to the firm is going to be um, about $20.24. So when divided into the numerator and adding that to the growth rates, we find the required rate of, rate of return on this firm stock, which in this case is the uh, cost of uh, equity when that equity, when common equity is raised in the form of the sale of new common stock because we, as you can see here, we have adjusted the price for the flotation costs incurred in the sale of uh, that common stock. So that's all there is to it and you have a couple of practice problems for you right here. The first here uses the CAPM where the risk-free rate is 3.8 percent and uh, the expected market return is 9.5 and beta is 1.24. So um, I set it up for you right here, the definition of the market risk premium, the stock's risk premium, and finally the uh, cost of common equity utilizing the security market line. So go ahead and hook it up and enjoy it. And finally, uh, you're also calculating cost of common equity using the DCF approach. And with the problem that you have here, uh, you can calculate it as uh, the cost of common equity when equity is generated, generated internally in the form of retained earnings and also when equity is generated externally in the form of the sale of new common stock. And so in this case, we're going to have to adjust price 
uh, by the flotation cost involved. So I uh, set it up for you. Go ahead and uh, plug and play and enjoy what you got and hope that puts a smile on your face. <laughs> All right, bye-bye.